if Mark had been a huge musical score, the passages that we're looking at today would be the time in the music where it shifts and we get to know that something new is happening, something different is happening. If we look at the gospel today, it's just, it's another healing. It's, it's rather small. It, it, what is so significant about it? You have to look at the entirety of the Gospel of Mark to realize how truly momentous the healing of Bartimaeus is in this story. So let's go back a little bit to earlier in the book of Mark, where every time Jesus did a healing or, or did something miraculous or, or was acknowledged to be something significant, he always told them to be quiet. It was only the demons that recognized him. And they told, he told them not to speak about it. Suddenly we're in the place of a healing where Bartimaeus knows who Jesus is, calls out his name repeatedly, and Jesus does not silence him. That's the change. That's the, that's the cue we know that something momentous is happening. And if you've read ahead, or if you've heard the entire gospel as uh, presented as a whole, you'll know that starting in the very next chapter, we're in Jerusalem, we're in the experience of Palm Sunday, and we continue on with the Passion. But before we get that, and after we've left the three uh, predictions of Jesus' death, uh, the three times when the disciples just don't get it, um, the, twice where children are, are highlighted as being the uh, the example of who uh, of how to behave when we come towards the new world that God wants to create, when healings have happened, when understanding has happened, it's this moment that we start our shift, where Jesus essentially comes out of anonymity and moves forward. And it's not uh, Jesus' followers, the one who have been with him all of this time, who recognize him and say it out loud. They're still a little confused about what's what. I mean, James and John just the other week were talking about who gets to sit on Jesus' right hand and left hand. And before that, we looked at the disciples discussing who was the greatest among them. Very worldly things, very understandable things, but very worldly. Bartimaeus, however, is just a beggar. He knows where to position himself, probably has been at it for some time, blind, um, has to trust others to a certain extent, but he probably has as much independence as possible, and calls out when he knows. And how does he know? We have no idea. But he knows that Jesus is approaching and calls out to him. And those around try to silence him. I mean, we've all been in that situation. I know when I was younger, my grandmother was constantly trying to silence me, um, as did other people, because we do not want anybody to disturb the peace. We don't want to ruffle anything. We also sometimes silence ourselves because we don't want to step out and make, a, make ourselves known. Bartimaeus had none of those concerns. Bartimaeus knew who Jesus was and called to him for help, for assistance. And Jesus went over and asked Bartimaeus what he wanted. Very simple. And that's actually how prayer works, too. When we present to Jesus, we can't just work on the assumption that, that Jesus is going to just miraculously understand where we are, we need to be able to articulate that to a certain extent too. I mean, yes, there's a certain extent that God knows who we are and, and we don't have to explain because God already knows. That's true. But in order for us to have genuine prayer, genuine want, we also have to be able to articulate what it is. Jesus isn't going to just give willy-nilly because our inner hearts have to be made honest, have to be on display. And Bartimaeus is. He says he wants to see again. He wants to be able to have that level of control. And for a beggar, for someone who is in extreme poverty, in order to see, he now becomes responsible for his own outcome. As long as he is marginalized, it might be a horrible existence, but it's an existence he knows. And he is asking Jesus for a different way of life, knowing that Jesus will provide. So he calls out to Jesus, son of David. Now, that should be a full stop right there. As we, kind of, we need to explore that a little bit. Because the assumption of the Messiah, so this assumption that was developed, um, we call it the intertestamental period, the period between the last of when the Hebrew scriptures was written and the first of when the Christian scriptures was written. This is the period in history when the Greeks were in control of um, uh, 
of Jerusalem, uh, Galilee, Israel, the whole area. And they had put a statue of, uh, I believe, Zeus in the temple, basically um, making it unpurified, um, desecrating it. And the Jewish rebellion developed. We now know that story through the story of Hanukkah and how when the Jews went in and, and or the Hebrews rather, I, I've, I've got to re keep my own consistent language going, when the Hebrews went in and they kicked the Greeks out and they kicked them out of the temple and they saw that the, the desecration and they needed the holy oil, which would take eight days to make and they only had enough for one. The oil lasted those eight days. That's the, that's the Hanukkah story. That's what our Jewish siblings are, celebrate that time of year. In December, um, around Christmas, but not always. That story happened in that period of time. And the other thing that happened in that period of time, I mean, lots happened, but one of the other significant to our purposes is this idea of the Messiah was developed. This savior who was going to come in and make a difference. This person who inherited the throne of David, who was seen as the last great king that the Hebrew people had this inheritor of David's throne was going to get rid of all the invaders. By the time this was developed by the Greeks, we had um, Babylonian exile, the Assyrian exile, um, others were around and warring on it. In order for them to have their own sense of independence, they believed they had to be returned to this kingdom of greatness, this kingdom of David that had overrun. And of course, following that the Romans take over. So there really is not a period of time when the Hebrew people are free. But they b develop this belief of the Messiah. Now the Messiah had a lot of different versions of how that was going to look. It was going to be one person, it was going to be a group of person people, it was going to be a warrior, but the, someone else was going to bring in um, the God state, or someone else was going to be the warrior, and the Messiah was going to bring in the God state. So there was a whole lot of ideas of what that could mean. Out of this period comes Jesus, and we enter into a world where we as Christians recognize him as the Messiah. Hebrews, the Jews don't. Um, they're still waiting. But we believe Jesus is the one. And to be an inheritor of the kingdom of David also meant to lead the army to take back the kingdom of David. This is one of the reasons the Romans were so scared of Jesus and didn't want him identified with, um, with the Messiah, because he got to people. He spoke a truth that really, really resonated deep down with where people were, and they wanted more of that, and they wanted the truth, and the Romans were terrified, and the Sadducees and the Pharisees were terrified, because if Jesus had enough momentum behind him, if he, if he had massed enough people, if he actually did come out as the warrior they had feared him to be, a lot of damage could have happened. The Romans could have potentially been kicked out. More likely they would have crushed everybody like it actually happened. Um, the Sanhedrin was worried that they would lose their position, which did actually happen. Um, so a lot of fear around this concept of Messiah and a lot of misunderstanding about what this was going to mean. His disciples were still kind of caught up in this worldly sense that they were going to be living in some kind of regal glory. I mean, G James and John asked to be on Jesus' right and left hand. They believed it was going to be an earthly experience. They had no concept of, of Jesus really dying. It was more of a, a symbolic death or a let's try to avoid this kind of death. It, it really didn't resonate for them. But here we have this blind beggar man who had no connection, had no experience with the teachings. All he knew was the stories he had heard filter down. He certainly hadn't traveled with Jesus. He, he was blind. He was only trying to, to eke out whatever living he could as a person, a, a marginalized person of poverty. But he knew the scriptures, and he knew Jesus to be the Messiah, and he knew Jesus, recognized Jesus to be the inheritor of the throne of David. Now, how absolutely incredible, then, that all he asks for is healing. He doesn't ask to raise arms. He doesn't ask to support the military coup. This person understands what Jesus is about. And Jesus doesn't silence him. He allows Bartimaeus to continue talking and asking for what he wants. And then when Bartimaeus is healed, he can see again, he joins them. 
he follows through with a better sense of what is now going to happen than the people who have probably been with Jesus from, since day one. And it's this crowd of people now that we envision moving towards Jerusalem. Now, the three Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Synoptic Gospels, they tell us that these people are part of the great pilgrimage of Passover, people who are coming into the city. The Romans are already on guard. The Sadducees and Pharisees are already on guard, wondering what's going to happen. There's a lot of tension in this. And in the midst of this, we have this innocuous little healing passage that is so profoundly eye-opening. That's what I mean. The music shifts. The score now is going to be heading towards the Passion, Holy Week, what that's going to look like, the destruction that's going to be involved. But just for a minute, we have the last remnants of the disciples walking in ignorance of people, marginalized people, recognizing Jesus for who he is as someone who can benefit them, and is and Jesus not saying to be quiet. So as we are on the cusp now of walking into Jerusalem, the gag order is finally lifted. We can talk about who Jesus is, who the Messiah is, what the promise is, what it's going to look like, and we can all kind of travel along. We are at the cusp. It's going to go downhill, and we know that. But right now, it's still so full of potential and acknowledgement and wonderment. It's a fantastic place to be as we leave this Sunday.